reading about the foundations of chemistry today. Oh, yeah. What did you learn? Well, I learned that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. It's interesting. I never thought about it that way before. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I also learned that there are three states of matter. Solid, liquid, and gas. I remember that from high school science class. Yeah, me too. And I learned that there are different types of chemical and physical properties. What's the difference between chemical and physical properties? Chemical properties are properties that describe how a substance reacts with other substances, while physical properties are properties that describe how a substance looks, feels, tastes, smells, and sounds. I see. That makes sense. And I also learned about the difference between physical and chemical changes. What's the difference? between those. Physical change doesn't change the composition of a substance, but a chemical change does. So, for example, if you melt a piece of ice, that's a physical change. But if you burn a piece of wood, that's a chemical change. Exactly. This is interesting. I'm starting to think that maybe I should have paid more attention in science class. <laughs> it's never too late to learn. Excuse me, ma'am and sir. Here's your order two American coffee. Please enjoy your stay in our cafe. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, what do you think? Are you interested in learning more about chemistry? I think so. It seems like a pretty cool subject. I'm glad you think so. I'll be happy to teach you more about it. Thanks. I appreciate that. So what are we waiting for? Let's discuss further more about chemistry. Good day everyone, I am Leslie and Tara from Group 1. Today, I will discuss the first two topics, matter and energy and states of matter under the chapter 1, the foundations of chemistry. So, let's discuss first matter and energy. Matter is anything that has mass and volume. For most common objects that we deal with every day, it is fairly simple to demonstrate that they have mass and take up space. You might be able to imagine, however, the difficulty for people several hundred years ago to demonstrate that air has mass and volume. Air and all other gases are invisible to the eye and have very small masses compared to equal amounts of solids and liquids, and they are quite easy to compress. Energy. When we speak of using energy, we are really referring to transferring energy from one place to another. Although energy is used in many kinds of different situations, all of these uses rely on energy being transferred in one of two ways. Energy can be transferred as heat or as work. But how are matter and energy related? Matter is the stuff that everything is made of and energy is a property that matter has. The same amount matter can have different amounts of energy and so represent different states of matter. For example, if you add energy to an ice cube made of water, it becomes liquid water. And if you add even more energy, it becomes steam. The kind of matter is the same and the amount of matter is the same as in the original cube, but there is more or less energy. There are many different types of energy, which all fall into two primary forms, kinetic and potential. Energy can transform from one type to another, but it can never be destroyed or created. Thermal or heat energy 
Thermal energy is created from the vibration of atoms and molecules within substances. The faster they move, the more energy they possess, and the hotter they become, thermal energy is also called the heat energy. Chemical energy Chemical energy is stored in the bonds of atoms and molecules. It is the energy that holds these particles together. Stored chemical energy is found in food, biomass, petroleum, and natural gas. Nuclear energy Nuclear energy is stored in the nucleus of atoms. This energy is released when the nuclei are combined or split apart. Nuclear power plants split nuclei of uranium atoms to produce electricity. Electrical energy. Electrical energy is the movement of electrons or the tiny particles that make up atoms along the protons and neutrons. Electrons that move through a wire are called electricity. Lightning is another example of electrical energy. Radiant energy. Radiant energy, also known as light energy or electromagnetic energy. Radiant energy is a type of kinetic energy that travels in waves. Examples include the energy from the sun, x-rays, and radio waves. Motion energy. Motion energy or mechanical energy is the energy stored in objects. As objects move faster, more energy is stored. Examples of motion energy includes wind, a flowing river, a moving car, or a person running. Sound energy. Sound energy is the movement of energy through substances. It moves in waves and is produced when a force makes an object or substance vibrate. There is usually much less energy in sound than in other forms of energy. Elastic energy. Elastic energy is a form of potential energy that is stored in an elastic object, such as a coiled spring or a stretch elastic band. Elastic object stores elastic energy when a force causes them to be stretched or squashed. Gravitational energy. Gravitational energy is a form of potential energy. It is an energy associated with gravity or gravitational force. In other words, the energy held by an object when it is in a high position compared to a lower position. And now, let's move forward to the next topic, the states of matter. A state of matter is a way to describe the behavior of atoms and molecules in a substance. And there are three common states of matter. Solids. Solids are relatively rigid, definite volume and shape. In a solid, the atoms and molecules are attached to each other. They vibrate in place but don't move around. Liquids. Liquids are definite volume but able to change shape by flowing. In a liquid, the atoms and molecules are closely bonded. They move around but stay close together. Each of these states is also known as phase. Elements and compounds can move from one phase to another phase if energy is added or taken away. The state of matter can change when the temperature changes. Generally, as the temperature rises, the matter moves to a more active state. The word phase describes a physical state of matter. When a substance moves from phase to phase, it's still the same substance. For example, water vapor, which is a gas, can condense and become a drop of water. If you put the drop in the freezer, it would become a solid. No matter what phase it is in, it is always water. Two atoms of hydrogen attached to one atom of oxygen. Good morning everyone, this is Ken Jasper Bio and today I am going to report the lesson 1.3, the chemical and physical properties. The learning objectives of these lessons are number one, identify a property or transformation as either physical or chemical representations. Number two, to separate physical from chemical properties. All matter has physical and chemical properties. First is the chemical properties. So what it means when we say chemical properties? So chemical properties describe the characteristic 
ability of a substance to react to form new substances. They include its flammability and susceptibility to corrosion. All samples of a pure substance have the same chemical and physical properties. Chemical properties of matter describe its potential to undergo some chemical change or reaction by virtue or its composition. Chemical properties are very useful in identifying substances. However, unlike physical properties, chemical properties can only be observed as the substance is in the process of being changed into a different substance. Here are the examples of chemical properties. Number one, flammable. How easily will the substance react when exposed to an open flame? Or in other words, how the substance react? Number two, radioactive. It is how the nucleus of the atom is going to change. Number three, oxidizer. This is a substance that promotes combustion and other materials. An example, when you mix nitric acid with copper, it creates a cool brown gas. Number four, corrosive. Can the object strip of electrons from metals? Toxic. This is a substance that can be poisonous or can cause health effect. Number six, explosive. A substance contain a great amount of potential energy that can produce an explosion. Number seven, pH. It's a chemical property and this is the potential of hydrogen and a measure of how acidic or basic a substance is. Second property is the physical properties. So what it means when we say physical properties? This is a characteristic that can measure without changing the composition of the sample under study such as mass, color, volume. A physical property is a characteristic of a substance that can be observed or measured without changing the identity of a substance. So here are the nine examples of physical properties. Number one, luster. Is the object shiny or dull? Number two, hardness. Cannot be scratched. Number three, ductile. Cannot be pulled into a wire. Number four, malleable. You can bend it. Number five, conductive. Heat or electricity move through. Number six, density. How heavy is it for its size? Seven, solubility. How easily can it dissolve? Eight, melting point. At what temperature will melt? Number nine, boiling point. At what temperature will it vaporize? To summarize this lesson, physical properties are characteristics that can measure without changing the composition of the sample under study, such as mass, color, and volume, and the amount of space occupied by a sample. Physical properties include color, density, hardness, and melting and boiling point. A chemical property describes the ability of a substance to undergo a specific chemical change. To identify a chemical property, we look for a chemical change. A chemical change always produces one or more types of matter that differ from the matter present before the change. The formation of rust is a chemical change because rust is a different kind of matter than the iron, oxygen, and water present before the rust form. Good morning everyone again. This is Ken Jasper View and today I am going to continue to report the lesson 1.4, the chemical and physical change. No matter where you are or what you are doing, things are changing all around you. Whether it's plant growing or logs burning or even if you're just eating food, the materials around you are changing in size, 
shape, and structure, releasing or absorbing energy. The learning objectives of these lessons are, first, review physical and chemical change of matter. Second, analyze and differentiate between various types of chemical and physical change. Chemical change. Chemical change are not reversible. A chemical change occurs when the composition of a substance is changed. When requires the breaking and forming of chemical bonds during a chemical reaction, this results in the rearranging of atoms in substances to form the products of a chemical reaction, which are brand new molecules that cannot be easily reverted back to their original states. Sometimes, it is difficult to tell if a chemical reaction has taken place to help determine whether there has a chemical reaction chemists consider the basic indicators that a reaction has occurred such a change in temperature a change in color the development of an odor the formation of a precipitate or the formation of a gas. The example of chemical change is when you burn wood, the wood is transformed into a new substance, ash. Just like baking, this change cannot be undone. Also, like the cookies, the wood changes color, releases gas, smoke, and produces an odor. Unlike in baking, this chemical change releases heat and gives off light. Chemical changes takes place all around us. Metal rusting, fireworks exploding, fruit ripening and digesting food are all examples of chemical change. Physical change. Physical change do not produce a new substance. Physical change in matter are often reversible. In a physical change, the material involved in the change is structurally the same before and after the change. Similarly, when a material changes space, it only changes physically. The substance is still the same. When a substance undergoes a physical change, its state or appearance is altered in some way. There is no change in chemical composition as no chemical reactions occur. Physical change may require an energy expenditure or energy may be taken in from the environment but the chemical identity of the original substance remain the same. A physical change may also involve cutting, dyeing, or some other physical alteration. Cutting a piece of cloth is an example of physical change. Even though the cloth changes shape and size, when it is cut, it does not create a new substance. It's still cloth. Even if the pieces of cloth combined together and made it into a shirt, only physical change have occurred. The shirt is still made of the same substance as the original cloth, just in a new form. Another type of physical change involves changing in state of matter, and water is the great example of this. Ice melts and becomes water, and water evaporates to become steam. But no matter its form, the water still water. One way we can tell this is a physical change is that the change can be undone. To summarize this lesson, remember that one way of then to distinguish a physical reaction from chemical reaction is that a chemical reaction 
cannot be easily reversed, if at all. Sometimes, it is difficult to determine whether a change is physical or chemical. The difference between a physical reaction and chemical reaction is decomposition. In a chemical reaction, there is a change in the composition of the substances in question. In a physical change, there is a difference in the appearance, smell, or simple display of a sample of matter without a change in composition. Although we call them physical reactions, no reaction is actually occurring. In order for a reaction to take place, there must be a change in the elemental composition of the substance in question. Thus, we shall simply refer to physical reactions as physical changes from now on. Remember that a physical change is a change in properties such as texture, shape, or state while a chemical change represents the formation of a new substance after atoms are rearranged in a chemical reaction. Good morning everyone, I'm Jinsen Basari Ambet and today I'm thrilled to take you on a capacitating journey into the world of science. Our focus, hmm, focus will be on mixture, substance, compound, and elements, the fundamental component that shape our existence from the air we breathe <sighs> to the water we drink ah. to the building blocks of the matter we play a vital role in our everyday lives throughout our time together we will explore their unique properties interaction and application across various fields so thank you for joining me so let's embark on this enlightening journey together a matter of facts mixture elements and compounds so in this report we will explore the classification of matter into mixture elements and compounds so scientists have a natural indication to classify things and one way they categorize matter is based on its composition so by understanding those classification we great insight mm -hmm. into the nature and behavior of different substance so let's dive into the world of matter classification so why is not a good idea to classify matter by its traits? So here's the answer. <laughs> Classifying matter is only based on its traits pose limitation. Yes, limitation. Like for instance, one kind of substance can exist in more or more than traits as seen in the case of water, H2O, which can exist as a solid from ice to liquid from water and to gas to water vapor so additionally matter can change phase basically easily but they therefore well, um, relying on phrases alone should, would not provide a comprehensive classification system all right so why is matter classified according to its physical characteristic just as color so here's the answer why physical characteristic like color may be visually striking they do not provide substantial scientific basis for classified um classify, classifying matter it would be impractical to a group of substance like gold sunflower and the sun together based solely on their color so scientific classification require a more comprehensive approach Scientists ask themselves those questions. Is it a matter uniform throughout? It can be separate by physical means. It can be separate by K 
chemical means. So, those questions ask in order to classify properly the matter. So, let's answer those questions one by one. So, let's start with the first question. Is the matter uniform throughout? So, if the matter is not uniform throughout, it falls into the category of heterogeneous mixture. So, heterogeneous mixtures do not appear in the same throughout and have a particle or particles that are large enough to can be seen and separated. Okay, now let's move on to the next question. Can it be separated by physical means? So, if matter can be separated by physical means, it falls into a category of homogeneous mixture or solution. So, homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures 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 appear the same throughout and have particles that are small and not easily recognizable solutions are special kind of homogeneous mixture where one substance dissolves in another now next question can, mm, me. can it be separated by chemical means if matter cannot be separated by physical means it falls into a category of pure substance, especially elements and compounds. So elements are the simplest form of pure substance that cannot be broken down into anything simpler. Meanwhile, compounds, on the other hand, are pure substance composed of two or more elements chemically combined in a fixed ratio. So, by asking those questions, scientists can classify matter into mixture elements and compounds, allowing for more systematic understanding of diverse nature of substance. So, in conclusion, the classification of matter into mixture elements and compounds provides scientists with a framework to understand the composition and behavior of different different substances. Like for example. Here we have the matter of low sharp. Hmm? So, by examining the uniformity, separability, and chemical characteristics of matter, scientists can categorize it accordingly. So, mixtures are combination of substances that retain their individual properties and can be separated by physical means. Meanwhile, elements are the simplest form of the pure substance while compounds are pure substance composed by two or more elements in fixed ratio. So through this classification system, scientists gain variable insight into the world of matter and further our understanding of the natural world. So here we have the example of heterogeneous mixture. We have sand and pebble, oil and water, powdered, iron and powdered sulfur so those are example of heterogeneous picture so let's move on so here we have so here we have granite so granite is one of the example of heterogeneous mixture so let's identify granite using matter flow chart all right so is the matter uniform throughout so granite is not uniform throughout it's a heterogeneous material Meaning, it does not have the consist composition or appearance throughout. So, granite consists of different minerals, just as quads and mica, which are arranged in granular or crystalline structure. Those minerals can be var varied in size, color, and distribution within the rocks, resulting in a speck or mountain appearance. Okay. Can it be separated by physical means? Granite can can be separated into its constituent materials through physical means, um, with the use of mechanical techniques such as crushing, grinding, and cutting. It's possible to break the granite into small fragments. This process allow for the separation of individual mineral grain present in the rock. Alright, now, it can be separated by chemical means. So, granite cannot be easily separated 
into its continued mineral by chemical means. The mineral within the granite are chemically bound together in the rock st structure. To separate the minerals, it would require chemical process that involve breaking, mm -hmm. breaking the chemical bonds and alternating the composition of the mineral. However, those chemical process are not typical apply separate separate grind night into its individual minerals to do the complex nature of the rocks and the particular challenge involved. So in summary, granite is a heterogeneous material that is not uniform throughout. It can be physically separated into smaller fragments or individual minerals drained through mechanical means. However, mm -hmm, separating granite into its continued material by chemical means is not common or practical process. So here we have colloids. So colloids are a type of homogeneous mixture where the particles are mixed together but not dissolved. Yes, it's not dissolved. The particles in the colloids are really large and are kept permanently suspended resulting in cloudy or milky appearance. So for example, uh, for the example of colloids, we, we have milk. So milk is a classic example of colloid. It consists a tiny fat of globulus dispersed, dispersed in water. When milk is left undisturbed, the fat from the milk, which is globulus, remains suspended throughout the liquid, giving it a homogeneous appearance. Alright, so let's have another example again. Um, another example is fog. So fog is another example of a colloid. It's a form when water vapor condenses into a tiny droplets in the air. Those droplets remain suspended and scattered light, causing the fog to appear opaque or cloudy. And all right, now let's talk about solution. So solution is a type of homogeneous mixture formed when one substance dissolves in another and another um it's it is the best mix of all mixtures mixtures dissolve and substance that those the those the dissolving the substance that is dissolved is the solution and substance that those the dissolving is the solvent okay example of solution is ocean water so, ocean water is considered as a solution because it meets the criteria of a homogeneous mixture formed when one substance dissolves in another. In, in the case of ocean water, it is the solution of various dissolved substance water. Um, the primary component of ocean water is water itself. Mm -hmm. The water itself, which acts as the solvent in this solution where water has the ability to dissolve the wide range of substance due to its polar nature. It forms hydrogen bonds with other polar molecules like ions and some um, certain compounds allowing them to become dispersed and dissolved within the water. Um, ocean, water ocean water contains numerous dissolved substances including salt, gases, and another mineral. The most abundant dissolved salt in water are sodium chloride, common table salt, and magnesium chloride. So those salt along with the trace amount of another minerals originate from the erosion of rock and minerals on land, volcanic such as um, volcanic activity and chemical process in the earth's crust. The dissolved gas in the ocean water include ox oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen are among others and those gases can be absorbed from the atmosphere or released through biological or physical process. Alright, let's move on to the next slide. So here we have the table. So in this table, the solution refers to the substance that is being solved, while the solvent is the substance in which the solution is dissolved. So, alloy. Alloy exhibit unique properties that can differ from those one of their individual complements metals. By combining different metals, alloying can be enhanced specific characteristics such as strength, 
hardness and durability, corrosion, <laughs> corrosion resistance, and electrical conductivity. Those improvement properties make alloy highly viable and research material used in various industry including engineering, construction, electronics, and transportation. Some here, here's some common example of alloy include brass, an alloy of copper and zinc, often used in musical instruments or plumbing fitting. Bronze, an alloy of copper and tin, known for its strength and historical significance of sculpture and tools. Um, we also have stainless steel, an alloy of iron, corium, and other metal elements renowned for its corrosion resistance and widespread use in kitchen appliances and construction. And we again, alloy offers the advantage of combining the desired properties. Means indicate that it is the pure substance, either an uh, element or compound depending on the nature of the metal present in the alloy. Alright, before we end, so let's have a quick recall about elements. So, elements are the simplest pure substance and elements cannot be changed into a simpler substance by heating or any chemical process. So, the smallest particle of the elements that has the property of the elements is called atom. So, atom is a basic building blocks of matter. So, there are more than 100 known elements in the universe listed in the periodic table of elements. So, those elements combine in just a way to create millions of compounds. So, elements. Elements, so all elements are made of atoms. Remember that and atoms of the same elements are alike. So, atoms of different elements are different. So, in 1830, in 1813, a system of representing elements with symbol was introduced. So, each symbol consists of one or two letters, and two letters are needed for a chemical symbol when the first letter of the element's name has already been used. So here we have the common elements. So we have aluminum, Al, bromine, Br, calcium, Ca, and carbon, C, gold is Au, helium is He, hydrogen is H, and nitrogen is N. Now, before we really end the discussion, so let's have a quick recall about compounds. So compounds are also known for pure substance but compounds are made from more or more than one element so water is a compound for example so water can be broken down into simpler substance like hydrogen and oxygen so that's all for the hi welcome again and today we embark on a journey into the fascinating world of chemistry as we delve deeper into this room, we encounter an essential aspect that forms the foundation of scientific exploration. In our time together, we will explore, explore how measurement play a vital role in understanding the composition, properties, and behavior of substance. So we will unravel the technique and tools used to qualify and analyze various elements compounds and mixture from the precision of balance and volumetric glassware to the integrated of analytical instrument we will discover how measurement enable us to unlock the secret of the chemical world by the end of our time together mm -hmm, you will appreciate the art and science behind the precise measurement empowering you Mm -hmm. you to approach chemistry with confidence and clarity so let's us embark on this enlightening explanation of measurement in chemistry and uncover the secret they hold 
So thank you for joining me on this coveting journey. Let's dive into the fascinating world of measurement and chemistry. In this slide, we introduce the topic of chemistry and measurement. Chemistry is defined as a study of all substance or matter and the change, change they undergo. It encompasses both physical and chemical change. Chemistry is considered the central science as it overlaps with many other sciences such as biology and earth science. Scientific method is a systematic approach used to answer questions about the natural world. It involves several steps. 1. Observation A scientist makes an observation which leads to a question. 2. Experiment Experiment is the question questions is tested through experimentation where hypotheses are formulated and tested. Okay, number three, we have conclusion. The results of the experiment are analyzed and a possible explanation known as conclusion is delivered. Now, four, we have natural law. If a conclusion is consistent and describe how nature behaves, it can be considered a natural law. Natural law can be duplicated and observed repeatedly. Alright, we have the last which is the scientific theory so a scientific theory is an explanation that goes beyond a natural law it provides a comprehensive understanding of why nature behaves in a certain way um, scientific theory are based on empirical evidence measurement measurement is a crucial aspect of science here are some key points about measurement every measurement consists of a numerical value or quantity. All measurements most include the units. In science, the metric systems, specifically the international system of units, SI, is widely used. The SI units are based on the are based on the base 10 system. Um, for example, length is measured in meters. Mass is in grams and time is in on seconds so some units are the vert units which are combination of ba base units for instance area is measured in square meters and volume is measured in cubic meters exceptions to base unit and metric prefix while most units in the metric system are based on on the 10 system there's a few exceptions volume is measured in liters which is based on the cubic meters temperature is measured in celsius to make units larger or smaller than the base unit metric first fix are used some common metrics per fix include kilo centi milli micro and nano Accuracy in measurements. Accuracy and precision are important concepts in measurement. Precision refers to obtaining the same answer consistently in repeated measurements. Accuracy refers to how close a measured value is to the accepted or true value. Uncertain measurements can occur due to the Instrument flaw, calibration issue, or human error during estimation. The true value is the estimate value taken to the farthest guess and uh, expressed with an uh, uncertainly range. The accepted value is correct value or measurement. Significant figures. Significant figures are the certain and estimate digit in a measurement. They help convey the precision and accuracy of measurement. Some rules of significant, significant figures include zero are not significant if they act as a placeholder. So zero after decimal point are significant. The Atlantic Pacific rule is used to determine the number of significant figures. For measurements without adds round points, count from the right starting with the first non-zero digit. 
for measurement with uh, decimal point, count from the left starting with the first non-zero digit. Calculations. In calculation, significant figures play a role in determining the precision of the final answer. In multiplication and division, the number with the least significant figure determines the number of significant figures in the answer. In addition and subtraction, the number with the least accuracy or least number of decimal place determines the number of decimal place in the answer. Rounding is applied when necessary with values of 5 or greater rounded up and value below 5 rounded down. Scientific notation. Scientific notation is a way to express numbers that are very large or very small, making them easier to work with. Step 1. Move the decimal points to create a number between 1 and 10. Step 2. Set up the scientific notation, leaving space for the exponent. Step 3. Count the number from space the decimal point move. Number 4. Step 4. Determine if the decimal move to the right or left. Right forward, right forward movement result in a negative exponent, while leftward movement result in a positive exponent. Step 5. Place the exponent in the scientific condition. Percent error. Percent error is used to compare a measured value to an accepted value. The formula for percent error is percent error equals measured value minus, minus accepted value divide divide accepted value times 100. Ratio or comparison between two quantities. One example is speed and another is density. And density is calculated by dividing mass by volume. Problem solving. So, problem solving involves several steps. First is identify the question and what needs to be solved. Second, develop a plan to solve the problem. Third, execute the plan and solve the problem. And lastly, check the answer for re reasonability. reasonability. So, dimensional analysis is a technique used to convert between different units. It involves setting up units, equalities, and canceling out units to arrive at the desired units for the answer. So we have a video example on how to solve or how to use the mentioned analysis. So let's go. Learn unit conversion the easy way. The method that we will be using to convert between units is known as dimensional analysis or the factor label method or even the unit factor method. But what we call it really doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that this is a versatile and powerful problem solving technique. So let's just do this. We're going to start with a simple unit conversion problem. A weightlifter can lift 495 pounds. How many kilograms is that? In order to solve a unit conversion problem like this, we first need one more piece of information, the conversion factor. For pounds and kilograms, the conversion factor is one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. Now, we're ready to solve this. The first thing you should always do is write down the quantity that you want to convert. This is the number from the question, not the conversion factor. Please also include the units. Next, we're going to multiply this number by a fraction. Inside the fraction, we're going to write the two numbers from the conversion factor. But how do we know which one goes on top and which one goes on the bottom? To answer that question, all we need to do is look at the units, which is why we always include the units in the calculation itself. The quantity we are starting out with has the units of pounds, so we take 2.2 pounds from the conversion factor and write it on the bottom. Next, because we want to end up with kilograms, we take 1 kilogram from the conversion factor and write it on the top of the fraction. Notice that the pounds that we started out with cancel out with the pounds on the bottom, and the units that we have left on the top are kilograms, which is exactly what we want to convert to. 
the only thing left to do now is plug the numbers in our calculator. You could of course put this in your calculator exactly the way it appears here, but maybe you don't have one of those fancy calculators that can do fractions, or maybe like me you just want to find a shortcut. Because the number on the top of the fraction is 1, this becomes a simple division problem. In your calculator type 495 divided by 2.2 and your calculator should tell you the answer is 225. Our final answer therefore is 225 kilograms. There is one more thing that we should notice about this problem. The fraction 1 kilogram over 2.2 pounds actually equals 1 because 1 kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. In fact, any time we do unit conversion, we are simply multiplying our initial quantity by a conversion factor fraction that equals 1. Okay, now that we are experts at this technique, let's try a slightly harder problem. A certain car has a mass of 1,920 kilograms. How many tons is that? Just like always, we need the conversion factor before we can solve this, but this time we need two conversion factors. One to convert from kilograms to pounds, and another to convert from pounds to tons. So this is going to be a two-step problem. We start the problem by writing down the quantity from the question, 1,920 kilograms. And then we multiply this by a fraction. The two numbers that go in the fraction come from one of the conversion factors. But what goes on the bottom? Because we are starting with kilograms, we write one kilogram on the bottom of the fraction so that we can cancel out the kilograms. Next, the other half of that same conversion factor, 2.2 pounds, has to go on the top. The kilograms cancel out, leaving us with pounds as the units of our answer. When you do the math in your calculator, simply multiply 1920 by 2.2. This time we are multiplying the numbers because the 1 of the conversion factor is on the bottom of the fraction. Our calculator tells us that the answer is 4,224 pounds. But we're not done yet. We still need to convert the pounds to tons. The second step works exactly the same way. First, we write down the number that we want to convert, that is, 4,224 pounds, and then we multiply this by a fraction. We want to have pounds in the denominator of the fraction so that we can cancel out the pounds. But which pounds do we choose? 2.2 pounds or 2,000 pounds? Remember that we want to convert to tons, so we choose the conversion factor between pounds and tons. We write 2,000 pounds on the bottom and one ton on the top. Our pounds cancel out and we are left with tons for the units of our answer. In our calculator, we type 4,224 divided by 2,000 because the one is on the numerator of the fraction. Our final answer works out to be 2.11 tons. Okay, we got the correct answer, but it turns out that there is an even better way to solve problems that involve multiple conversion factors. Rather than solving this in two separate steps, we can combine those steps into one step with two conversion factors. Check this out. Once again, start the problem by writing down the quantity that you want to convert. Multiply this by conversion factor fraction, putting what you want to cancel out on the bottom and what you want to convert it to on the top. Notice that so far this is exactly the same as the first step we just did. However, instead of solving this as it is, we're going to multiply it by another conversion factor fraction. We now need to cancel out the pounds that are left on top, so we put 2,000 pounds on the bottom. We chose 2,000 pounds rather than the 2.2 pounds because we ultimately want to convert the quantity to tons. This gives us tons as our remaining units on top while all the other units cancel out. We then proceed to calculate from left to right. If the 1 is on the bottom, we multiply. If the 1 is on the top, we divide. So, we multiply 1,920 by 2.2 and then divide that answer by 2,000. Final answer is 2.11 tons, which is exactly what we got the first time. But now we can see how powerful this method is. No matter how many conversions you need to do, putting the conversion factors in fraction form helps you to know when to multiply or divide. Thanks for watching. Please comment, vote, subscribe, or check me out on ketsbook.com.